Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we should have all the problem sets on the table in four piles by GSI. So hopefully those are all there. That was a fun little exercise, I'm sure, or not. So um, one of the things that we uh, have seen over the last week or so is that when we have tariffs or import quotas or voluntary export uh, restraints, is that there is a loss of national economic welfare. Uh, that's always the case in, uh, for a small country, and it's generally the case even for a large country, unless uh, it is large enough to have a huge effect on the terms of trade. So um, one of the things that we need to ask ourselves then is if these kinds of trade barriers actually reduce national economic welfare, why is it that governments actually impose these types of trade barriers? The number of tariffs and import quotas and voluntary export restraints that have been imposed over the years is actually quite significant. And indeed, we've seen a sharp increase in the use of both tariffs and import quotas uh, in the last several years, let alone over the last five or ten years. Now, it turns out that um, it must be because there are reasons beyond just the calculation of the cost and benefits on national economic welfare that make a difference. Otherwise, that's all that mattered. Governments presumably would not do this. So that's what we want to be looking at today and uh, on Thursday. To start with, though, we want to make the case for why governments should support free trade. That is, not interfere with free trade. So that's where we want uh, to start. Now, the basic arguments for a free trade situation essentially rest on four hypotheses. One is that free trade increases economic efficiency, right? We don't have production and consumption distortions because the production and consumption decisions are being made at the free market price. And we assume that free markets uh, determine uh, the most efficient allocation of resources. We also know that economies of scale can lead to, I'm sorry, free trade can lead to economies of scale or the gains from economies of scale. So that would be an argument. It may also be the case, and you may remember this from exam one, uh, the free trade may lead to an increase in productivity. And so productivity may be a reason. And then a fourth argument is that uh, free trade actually gives the government what we would refer to as political neutrality. So we're going to look at each of these in a little bit more detail, uh, just to make sure we understand them all uh, well. Um, and so when we talk about free trade increasing economic efficiency, again, what we saw last week was that when we impose trade barriers, we create production and consumption distortions. There may be other things that are created as well, but we're always left with those production and consumption distortions. So to the extent that we can get rid of trade barriers, we would also get rid of those production and consumption distortions. So here's a situation where we already have a trade barrier in place. And so if we were talking about getting rid of that tariff in the home country, in this case the U.S., what we would see is that uh, the world price, the world, I'm sorry, the price in the U.S. would fall, um, and that would lead to an increase in demand and a decrease in output or supply in that industry. And that, uh, that would also result in a lower world price, uh, I'm sorry, a higher world price, uh, or price in the um, exporting country, and therefore they would actually increase their production and decrease their domestic demand uh, to get us back to operating at a better world price. And the quantity of international trade would increase. So we would see then that by eliminating a tariff, we actually increase the volume of international trade, and both consumption and production decisions in both countries are actually being made at the same world price rather than at differential prices. So if we look at it uh, in terms of welfare considerations, let's suppose that we know that this, by the way, is the importing country. So if we get rid of the tariff, the tariff-ridden price will fall to the world price. And we could look at the changes in consumer surplus. Consumers, of course, are much better off with a lower price. So consumers would be better by A, B, C, and D. Producers, of course, would lose with a lower price, but they only lose area A, so producer surplus goes down. We would also lose the government revenue from this, because if there's no tariff, obviously there's no tariff revenue. And so what we see then is that the net effect is getting back the production and consumption distortions that we had before, but we lose our terms of trade effect. Now, as I've said before, the terms of trade effect only, would only dominate the production and consumption distortions if the tariff were actually relatively small. And it actually appears as if most tariff rates are well above the kind of tariff rate where the terms of trade effect would, be, um, would dominate here. So we've got some efficiency gains by not having those production and consumption distortions uh, that we have when we impose a tariff. Now remember, even if the terms of trade effect were to dominate here, and this would be reducing our own national economic welfare, those terms of trade effect essentially represent our market power, this importing country's market power, its ability to influence the prices that others pay. So we could think of that in some sense as having some quasi-monopoly power which, of course, is uh, not typically viewed as being beneficial to the world when we uh, exercise that power. Now, we can also look at this from the exporting country's point of view. So here, for the exporting country, the price is rising. And here, we can see that consumer surplus changes in. So consumers are worse off by area A and B because they have to pay a higher price, but producers are much better off by A, B, C, D, and E. There's no government revenue involved here, so we see that the net effect of getting rid of this tariff is an increase in C, D, and E. So clearly the exporting country 
would be much better off. The gain in producer surplus is much better than the loss of producer surplus. I'm sorry, consumer surplus. Where we see just the opposite, of course, in the importing country. So this then gives us some feel for the fact that getting rid of a tariff actually would increase economic welfare in both the importing as well as the exporting country. This is always true for a small country. That is, it would improve the importing country's welfare. It will also be true for a large country, exporters for sure, importers, as long as the terms of trade effect are not too great. Now, a second reason to uh, support free trade is that we get larger economies of scale. So larger economies of scale. When we deal with protected markets, and by the way, we don't care here whether this is monopolistic competition or whether this is external economies of scale. In both cases, as long as we've got economies of scale, we'll get essentially the same result. When we have trade protection, we've already seen that we have reduced market sizes. We have less international trade going on. If markets are small, then obviously, if you have economies of scale, you'll be on a higher portion of your average cost curve, which means that you'll have fewer varieties or you will have higher costs or you will have both fewer varieties and higher costs. So free trade allows countries to take advantage of larger markets and operating at a larger scale of production. So here's an example of, is this monopolistic competition or external economies of scale? Okay. Monopolistic competition, external economies of scale. So how do we know this is monopolistic competition? Well, we've got the number of firms on the horizontal axis, which would tell us that. So external economies of scale, we have an average cost curve here, so we've got a quantity. So here we've got a price curve and a cost curve. So we know just by looking at this diagram, this would be a monopolistic competition um, model. So what happens when we get rid of trade barriers and we increase the size of the market is that our cost curve will shift to the right. That means that we will get an increase in the number of firms, which, by the way, also means an increase in the variety of products, since we have differentiated products in this industry, and we'll also see a lower price. So we've got more firms operating at a larger scale, taking advantage of economies of scale to drive down their average cost. Competition also drives down the price, which benefits consumers, and consumers are also benefited by the fact that they have more variety to choose from. So that seems like a pretty good deal for consumers. A third reason for supporting free trade is that it may increase productivity. So if we increase productivity, we have all sorts of good things going on. By the way, the problem that you had to work on where there was a change in productivity is actually an example that comes out of the Canadian-US free trade agreement and some economic studies that were done after that that showed immediately after the uh, free trade agreement was passed back in the late 80s that the Canadian manufacturing industry went into a big nosedive because they couldn't compete primarily because of a scale issue with American manufacturing firms. And many Canadian manufacturing firms went out of business. But the ones that survived five years later were much bigger, much more productive. And in fact, after eight years, employment in Canadian manufacturing was larger than it was before the, uh, uh, before the free trade agreement was passed uh, with much, much higher productivity levels. So there is that competitive, those competitive pressures that come from free trade that force you to either get more productive, more efficient, or die as a firm. Not as an individual, I hope, but as a firm. Firms either go out of business or they figure out how to compete with more efficient firms elsewhere in the world. So if we came back to diagrams that we had much earlier in terms of production possibilities frontiers, the way that we could show this is that if we had increased productivity, what we should see is that the production possibilities frontier would shift out. Now, that productivity could be biased towards one product or the other. I've shown it biased more towards wine than to cloth over here because I'm a fan of adult beverages. So, but productivity says that as long as we've got some productivity increases in both industries, even with the same capital and labor resources, we can now produce more of each good. So even if the relative prices don't change, so our ISO value line still has the same slope. I'm not saying that the ISO, that prices wouldn't change, but let's just see what happens if they don't. We would now be at point C in terms of production, producing more of both goods. So increased productivity gives us a huge bump here, and that also means that we're going to be on a higher country indifference curve, and therefore we'll be consuming at point D, and again consuming more of both goods. So we're clearly better off. We've moved up to a higher country indifference curve. So productivity, increases in productivity are unambiguously good for individuals as well as firms as well as for countries. And then finally, we can make the argument, or people have made the argument, that free trade provides what we think of as political neutrality. One of the real difficulties about providing trade protection at the industry or firm level is that we then get capture, policy capture, by the industry or the firm. In other words, once you provide me with a benefit, a tariff, an import quota, I have a vested interest in, maintain, in having you maintain that tariff or that import quota for all sorts of reasons, right? I get a benefit from that. I'm going to protect my own self-interest. And so what you find is that firms that do or industries that do receive trade protection have a tendency to have a lot of political contributions in order to try to maintain the protection that they are enjoying. Because, of course, it expands their production. It expands their revenues. It expands their profits. So it also reduces the competitive pressures uh, that they are under. So a commitment to free trade actually means... We don't have to worry about all those political pressures, all those individual little pieces going on in various different firms and industries who want to maintain or sustain a particular level of protection. Now, there is one other way to have trade protection, but to get away from this political neutrality issue. 
and that is to have what we refer to as a uniform tariff. All imports have exactly the same tariff rate. So notice that in that case, we have protection against all, for all import competing industries, but we're not favoring any one industry over another by having differential tariff rates. As far as I know, Chile is the only country that currently has a uniform tariff rate. So while it sounds great, nobody uses it. Again, for lots of political reasons and historical reasons, they're already, most tariff rates are already in effect, and it'd be really hard to um, change those selective tariff rates. So if we look at these um, cases, what we would see is that if you look at it in the case of the industrialized countries, the standard cost of uh, trade, production and consumption distortions, seem to be about 1% of world GDP. The other benefits, which really has to do with what is the lost productivity from trade protection that we could gain if we got rid of all of these trade protection items, so those are, that's what I mean by other benefits here, seem to be, at least based on the Canadian evidence, about 3%. Now, obviously, we know what happened in Canada. We don't necessarily know what would happen in other countries. So this one's a little bit harder to measure than, uh, than uh, other, uh, other cases. But what that suggests is that trade distortion, or the distortions caused by tariffs and import quotas and, and such, cost about 4% of world GDP. Now, it may be you think 4% is not very much. But world GDP is $50 trillion. So I don't know about you, but I'd like to have my share of 4% of $50 trillion, because that still sounds like a large number. Um, and so when you're talking about very, very large numbers in terms of world GDP, even small percentages can still add up to substantial benefits. And then finally, um, we have much less pressure uh, on the political system, which may also cause um, all sorts of uh, misallocation of resources internally to the country, having nothing to do with trade itself, but rather people's faith uh, in the fair execution or fair administration of government policy. So that's the case for free trade. But we still have to come back to, okay, if we can make the case that free trade is so wonderful, how come we don't use it very often? Or how come very few countries uh, actually pursue free trade? Now, one of the reasons might be because economic efficiency is not the overriding goal of the government. Right? The arguments that we're making for free trade is that it gives us greater economic efficiency by having a better allocation of resources on the production side and a better mix of consumption on the spending side. But if economic efficiency is not your goal, then presumably that may, all of that may be nice, but that may not be enough to prevent you from uh, implementing some sort of trade policy. So a number of arguments that have been made for trade policies recognize that a trade barrier can do the following. So we limit imports, which increase domestic production. It increases domestic resource usage. It decreases domestic consumption. It increases government revenue. And it also changes the allocation or distribution of income. Okay? So those are some of the things that we know happens when we impose trade barriers. Now, the question we want to ask ourselves is the following. Are there any extra benefits over and above the cost-benefit analysis that we've done that suggests that additional production in this industry, the industry in which we're providing the import limitation, is extra beneficial. Are there extra benefits to increase production, to increase employment or other resource usage in that industry? Is there something particularly beneficial about less consumption of that product or about additional government revenue from that source? Or is there something extra beneficial about a different allocation of income? And the fact of the matter is, there might be. There very well might be something extra beneficial. Remember, our free market allo efficient allocation of resources is assuming that the market price is actually the correct price. It may or may not be. So it may not be because there may be a market failure. When there are no market failures, the free market is considered to be what we call a first best solution. So, but when there is a market failure, we're not going to get to that first best solution. So we're going to have a suboptimal outcome by relying on the marketplace. So the first best solution essentially requires that all private incentives are perfectly aligned with all social incentives. Now, it's pretty easy to see the private incentives, private costs that firms incur when they hire resources, private costs that consumers incur when they buy something. It's much more difficult to see what the social costs or the social benefits might be. So even though there may be a market failure, that doesn't mean that we can measure it precisely or maybe even imprecisely. But in a first best solution where everything's aligned, what do we see? Price equals the marginal benefit, which also equals the marginal cost, which, by the way, equals the social marginal benefit, which equals the social marginal cost. So in this situation, notice private benefits and social benefits match and private cost and social marginal cost also match. Well, this is true in very limited circumstances. It essentially requires